Hi, everybody. I just want to say thanks for all the really great talks. This has been a really good conference experience. I know with everybody being separated from everyone else, it's really nice to actually get this opportunity to sort of see people's faces and hear what everyone has been working on. Um, I am going to be giving a talk, as Jamie introduced, that's about um, impact melts, but not in sort of the proximal case that we've mostly been talking about in other talks where we've brought it up. But talking about what happens when we actually have distal impact melt that is uh, large distances away from the crater. And we're going to look at specifically Tycho. And the reason the secondary crater chains part is in the title here is just because I know that there's been a lot of controversy historically about the presence of distal impact melt. And so we're really trying to focus in this talk on not where is all of potential distal impact melt, but trying to look at really um, very convincing cases. And a lot of those are near areas with Tycho secondary crater chains. And this is some work that I did with my undergrad students, Janice Party and Jess Nabel Crossan at Ursinus College. So just a really quick picture here. There's gonna be lots of pretty pictures in this talk. Um, this is an L Rock Knack image from the central peak of Tycho Crater, just to look at sort of the fact that kind of a type example of what some of the morphologies we're gonna be looking at at these distal impact melts. Um, things like we have sort of a, a margin here that has a lot of blocks in it. In this, the sort of down direction is from the sort of left to right of the screen. We have these cracks in our sort of smooth dark melt material. And so if you have sort of an inferred flow direction here from left to right, these cracks are sort of perpendicular roughly to the edge of that flow. Um, and so just, we have this picture in here that this is kind of the really classic impact melt morphologies that we were looking for when we were looking for impact melts. We're not trying to do anything that looks sort of, you know, more questionably is this melt than that. Um, and what we found in sort of our preliminary study when we were just trying to look at things associated with Tycho Crater, um, we have here a little arrow pointing to where Tycho is and then all of the little yellow areas um, out to sort of the northwest from Tycho along this sort of prominent ray and then off to the sort of southeast from Tycho. Those little yellow areas are areas where we found some of these sort of classic looking melt morphologies. We'll talk a lot more over the course of the talk about what do some of these regions have in common where we found these melt deposits. Um, is there, you know, what sort of data sets were we using to actually try and find them? We'll get into all of that later. Um, but basically what we found is that there are 143 of these regions there are, you know, not necessarily one little melt deposit per region, so don't take that as a hard and fast number of the distinct number of melt units that were associated with this. And they were sort of clustered in range between, you know, about three crater radii away from Tycho to sort of out in the more like 11 crater radii away from Tycho. And so there's just sort of a little indication of sort of the directions from Tycho where we found most of these. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about sort of uh, a couple little regions that we just sort of named. This one right here talked about sort of the Heinz's Q region. Um, it's about 140 kilometers away from the center of Tycho. This one is the Heinz K region, about 215 kilometers away from the center of Tycho. Um, and this one, the Wurzel Bauer D region, about 275 kilometers away from the center of Tycho. Um, and again, you can sort of already start to see some of the trends that are happening here. Um, if Tycho is right down here at the far end of that uh, figure, um, and you can see that there's some really prominent Tycho secondary crater chains that show up in this image, these regions are all sort of closely associated with where those Tycho secondary chains are. And they all happen to be sort of on steeper Tycho facing slopes. And so that's a trend that we'll come back to as well. Um, what we did is that we looked for a lot of these when we were first looking with my students of just looking on that uh, LROC Quick Maps tool um, with the Diviner Rock Abundance Map on there um, as a proxy for sort of trying to find some of these regions. It happens to be where we sort of first noticed them when we were looking through something else for another project. Um, and so this is just sort of a really quick example of you can't really see a lot of it here, but sort of up in this region by sort of Heinz's G, there's these little tiny areas of elevated rock abundance in the maps, and those were the features that we were using to sort of find where these regions were um, and then confirm them by looking at the high resolution NAC imagery to sort of find that morphology like we saw in the first slide. Um, here's just a really quick um, inset box of where over to the other direction in the southeast ray we were seeing these. Again, we sort of have this imaginous crater right here, sort of in the southeast corner. A lot of these little areas are concentrated. This is about 300 kilometers away from the center of Tycho. And then down here in the Lilius region where there's a really beautiful cluster of Tycho secondary craters actually just downrange from that. 
um, this sort of cluster of impact melt regions that's about 450 kilometers away from the center of Tycho. So again, to sort of, I promised that we would do a little bit more about sort of what we were actually looking for when we were just looking through to see where were regions we might want to look for some of these impact melt morphologies. This is that region from Lilius um, that just on the previous slides so was sort of right down here, about 450 kilometers away from Tycho. This is the rim of that crater, right? And so this is sort of down in the inward slopes and we'll have more figures later on with more of the topography in these regions when we look at the Heintzis region in more detail. But you can see that there are on the sort of inward steep parts of these Tycho facing slopes, there are these little areas of elevated rock abundance from the diviner rock abundance. Um, and so I just wanna do, first of all, again, a really quick sort of gallery of some of the types of morphologies that we saw, again, to try and kind of convince you that we're, we're not being wishy-washy about these looking like they're melt morphologies. Um, we can see that this one has sort of things we were looking at, there's a sort of a distinct margin here. There's again, sort of blocky areas. There are these cracks sort of moving along. This, this is on a very steep downward slope. Um, this is another sort of set of those, you know, again, sort of clear margins some of the time. Um, we'll see in some of these other ones that you also have margins that are less distinct, where sort of the, the areas with the cracks and the blocks seem to merge a little bit more seamlessly in the surrounding terrain. But again, some of these really, um, clear crack features associated with that. This is that Lilius region zoomed in a little bit. So we can see that there are these regions of these really distinct and blocky margins. There are again, downhill and this is from sort of the bottom right to the top left. Um, we can see that there are cracks, but also sort of on the sort of region down here to the bottom left, there's less of a distinct margin between where you see some of these sort of crack features um, and where it sort of looks like there's maybe just areas of uh, isolated blocks. And this is again another region where we have sort of more of those. There's a lot of blocky material and cracks but sort of less obvious margins that are associated with these. And then again just to round out sort of what types of things we were looking at when we identified these 143 regions. Just again sort of block rich cracks, some areas with sort of more obvious margins and others that sort of grade more evenly in the surrounding terrain. All right. Um, and so we just did some really quick, just sort of looking if there were any trends just on a, a really superficial level as we went through this, um, the number of these different regions that we identified as a function of distance. And I think about all that you can take out of this super, super um, quick uh, quantitative look at this is that mostly what we were using to identify these regions is that if they had the blocky material, right? Um, it's over 90% of the regions identified at all of the distances had some sort of block rich material. So that was really one of the things um, that sort of stood out for having us uh, classify these regions, which makes sense if we're using that rock abundance map as a proxy to begin with, that we were sort of preferentially going to find regions that had um, a lot of block rich material. And we'll try when we look at Heinches here in a second to see if we can sort of tease out if maybe there's something more complicated than that that's happening, where maybe it's easy to find the block rich regions, but once you look around in those areas that there's something a little bit more complicated going on. Um, so again, in terms of how we're identifying it, I just want to look through a couple really quick regions. This is in that Maginus crater area in the sort of southeast part. Again, this is right near the rim, the southeast rim of Maginus uh, Basin, and we have, these are some uh, craters that might be Tycho secondary craters, and there's some sort of smooth material in the center of them. If we look in our uh, inset that has the diviner rock abundance map over the top of it, we can see that there are several regions here with sort of elevated rock abundance. That would be sort of in this region, down in those regions, and we're going to zoom in in a second to this region right here. And so there's the little inset. And so you can in fact see, again, the Tycho direction is the top left in these images. The sort of uh, local topographic high is to the bottom right on that interior Tycho facing rim of Maginus Basin. And you can see, again, we sort of saw in one of our type examples, this little area up here was one of those insets, um, that you have these regions where there are sort of areas where you have really distinct margins of these melt deposits and cracking. Um, blocks, but you also have sort of if you look nearby in this existing crater, you have this region of sort of flat floor down to the, the lower topographic area 
um, where you're asking me the question of, it's, it's very difficult to say, I think, um, conclusively without other information, is that impact melt? Um, but we're going to see a lot of that type of feature repeated over and over again. Also, uh, in regions where we do see these kind of classic melt morphologies um, that are associated with melt flows, we also see these sort of flat floor craters. Um, again, really quickly here, this one, we're going to actually have some of the topography data. Um, so this is from the, the Wurzelbauer region, and I like this one because we do actually have this very clear Tycho secondary crater chain that's associated with this region. Um, if we look at it with the Lola topography data on top of it, what we can sort of see, again, Tycho is in this direction down to the bottom right. We have that up here on there's sort of a flat plateau on the edge of the, this is sort of the crater rim <laughs> right here. So this is sort of up at the top where we have the Tycho secondaries. And we're gonna see that in this region down here to the right and down here to the right, which um, I can't see on mine because your faces are blocking it off, but there's a tiny little elevated rock abundance region down here associated with one of those. And the other region um, does not have a very obvious rock abundance elevation. And so if we zoom in on those now, this is the region that did have the um, Joanna rock abundance map, um, elevated rock abundance. And so we can see, again, we have sort of this margin and all of these cracks and then sort of grades off into these other regions where it's a little bit more difficult to find a distinct margin to these units. Um, oops, sorry, clicking too fast. Um, and then again, this region up here that didn't necessarily have the, the rock abundance elevated, you can see there are less of those sort of block rich margins, but lots of cracks. And again, sort of if you look at the topography here, the sort of direction of this flow is looks like it's flowing along the areas of steepest local slopes. And again, in a second here, we're going to look at the Heinsis region, where we can actually sort of go in more detail with that kind of a local um, interaction between topography and what we're seeing with these morphologies. Um, here, just really quickly, again, from the Quick Maps tool from one of my students, we're just trying to find um, where some of these regions were. Again, if you take the profiles here, you can see that a lot of these are going to be in regions um, where we have really steep Tycho facing slopes. All right, and so now let's talk about specifically in sort of this Heinzisch region, which was in sort of the closest region to Tycho and in that northwestern part of the Ray. Um, we can sort of see again, this region all sort of lies in the sort of inter-ray region between these chains of Tycho secondary craters. Um, if we look here in just the Elrock WAC image, there's not really an obvious signature, um, unless you're, if you were just moving around, or at least if I were just moving around the WAC, I wouldn't necessarily notice what's happening right here. But if we put the rock abundance uh, data on there, this is, I think, a really good illustration of the kind of thing that was tipping us off when we were looking for these. You can see that there are these elevated rock abundance areas in there. And in fact, if you take the uh, LROC NAC images, you can see that there is, in fact, this area um, of these melt feature sort of morphologies in what looks sort of at first glance to be a flow that's about 13 kilometers long down here. It matches up again really well with where those rock abundances are. And I know registration is not always perfect at sort of the, the NAC scale to the WAC to the rock abundance, but still pretty good correlations here. Um, again, if we want to look, it drops about 1800 meters from this top part of the flow to the bottom part of the flow. Um, what we found is if we sort of watch along the elevation profile, um, sort of where we're going, that first area sort of up at the top here, it's not in fact flowing <laughs> um, down the direction of this profile. It actually looks like it's flowing from this crest of this hill down from sort of the left to right, um, which makes sense because if we go back, that's sort of the, the plateau part um, sort of at the top of this profile, so it's not actually flowing down this terrain here. But if we get to sort of this part here, we can see um, that actually there's a really nice change in the morphology, which we'll look at later of the flow between sort of this part of the profile and then when it sort of sh gets shallower down here on the rest of the profile. Um, so I just want to, these, I just want to, again, the, the morphologies here are so beautiful. I don't really have a lot to say about this in particular. We're just going to look sort of down this flow of sort of seeing the kinds of morphologies. So I'm not going to talk very much. I'm just going to give a couple seconds for each of these slides. Um, so you can see, again, this one has a really clear um, sort of distinct margin at the end. 
We have some existing craters that look like maybe they're being infilled by this, maybe some craters that formed potentially after this that have really block rich ejecta. Um, again, this is about the region in this slide where we have that sort of kink in the steepness of the flow. I'm just trying to get an opportunity to see how beautiful these really look. And there's, there's actually that little kink in where it's steep here in the flow and then it's shallower there. And you can see that sort of mimicked in the terrain. And then there, I'll leave it at that one for a second, just because it's such a really, I think, amazing image that you can sort of see this. Um, we took topographic profiles sort of along the edge of that flow back in what was just in the last slide. And you can sort of see this is zoomed in. I'll have more context in a second, but sort of this region in the center is roughly that flow margin. Um, it looks like it's about uh, half a kilometer wide. It's about sort of five to 10 meters high at its highest point. Um, you can see here where we actually took that profile. And this is again, zoomed out from what we saw in the last slide. That's sort of the left bar um, edge here on the left where the center is and the far edge on the right. Um, and again, just to sort of confirm uh, the direction of the flow here, we took 11, 11, elevation profiles sort of along these red bars. Um, and what we found is, again, those first four profiles on the top are not, in fact, flowing down the orange line, but are flowing from sort of the southwest to northeast along those. But then once we reach this part right here, that flow looks like it's sort of more down in the central valley in the middle of this topography. And so it's sort of flowing down along that orange line in this last part after the kink. Um, and so again, this is that sort of high uh, elevation area where again, it's sort of flowing down that direction. We also saw that there's some flow in the other directions from the top of this hill. And sure enough, sort of at the bottom here, we have another one of those areas of elevated rock abundance. This is the margin of that flow, which is flowing again sort of down from left to right here and not as we naively assume from sort of top to bottom. Um, again, though, sort of in this region to the, the south, west of that crest, we see again sort of these regions of these uh, pre-existing craters that look like they have been sort of made ghost craters or filled in by something. Um, that would be sort of in this region um, where we have, uh, it's sort of flatter in the plateau in this region where we have sort of the filled in ghost craters and then sort of we will see it sort of slopes off to the right and we see more of again the block rich types of morphologies once we start to have steeper local slopes. Um, and we'll just zoom in on that. So again, you can see this is sort of at the transition between where over to the left, it's sort of flatter, more of a plateau, and over to the right, we're starting to sort of fall down the interior of a crater wall. And sure enough, we start to see from out of those sort of smooth filled crater regions, we see at their margins that they have this blocky material. Um, and then, so that was like up here, this is down now at the bottom of that steep crater wall. And sure enough, you can see that there's one of these regions that's the one that shows up with the elevated rock abundance that again has those sort of classic margins. Same thing over here. I mean, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go really quickly through this, but we can see um, sort of in this region, again, same thing at the crest, you see sort of sort of smooth and infilled craters and where it gets locally more steep, you start to see the pots. And this is the really nice example of that. And so sort of our little picture of looking in detail at this region is that we have a couple little areas of impact melt that hit the surface, seem to sort of flow down locally steep slopes in the places where locally the slope is not very steep. We sort of saw those smooth regions, infilled craters, maybe some cracks, but by and large, not a lot of the really classic impact melt flow morphologies that were allowing us to really say um, sort of more convincingly that this is impact melt. But as soon as we reach regions where there were steeper local slopes, you start to get that elevated rock abundance. You see sort of the classic margins. These are more um, convincingly impact melts in those regions. And so the conclusion that I want to leave is that I think that, you know, distal impact deposits are really complicated. I think we've seen a lot of good talks over the last couple of days, um, particularly, you know, thinking about the equilibrium and you know what role crater rays play in bringing that together and I think that this work is just another way of reminding people to be careful when you're thinking about what impact craters do that really they do have I think the opportunity to really do a lot of modification of the surface long distances away from the crater themselves and a lot of the cool things that we've been talking about in sort of proximal ejecta like what is the influence of the terrain type on what your size frequency distribution of the craters you count on is going to be that some of those things um, 
may also be true in sort of areas around secondary craters where maybe you have impact melts that could be incorporated into some of that um, ray debris. So thanks very much. Thank you, Cassie. Interesting. We have only five minutes for questions. Stuart, would you like to take over? Uh, well, it doesn't actually look like there are questions in the chat. There are two comments. Okay. Uh, one is from Bill McKinnon that I think referenced some earlier slides. Uh, he wrote, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, to make sure to include uh, scale bars in your images. Yeah, uh, I think that was the, the ones at the beginning where I was just trying to do what kinds of things we saw that, yeah, so. Yep. Uh, Paul Shank noted that the fractured terrain peeking through the ejecta in one shot uh, was interesting. And we have a new question, um, Catherine Nish. Um, are there any of these locations near the Apollo landing sites? So I don't think from the ones that we've identified so far, and I know in my, my dissertation work, I looked a little bit at um, some of the, the light mantle and I, I don't think we, we looked up there, um, but not out of the ones that we've seen so far. Um, Mike, Michael um, Davias, and sorry for pronunciations, what qualification is used to differentiate between melt versus flow of hydrated ejecta? So um, again, Part of what we're trying to do here is that it is actually really hard to say um, without, you know, doing sort of chemical analysis of, of these, I would say, uh, for sure what they are. So we were really trying to focus on things that were, would be really hard for us to explain um, due to processes that did not involve some sort of melted material that was flowing. And again, I think that makes it easier to find the ones like we were saying on sort of locally steeper slopes, because then that seems to be where you start to see, you know, things that are sagging a little bit as they're, as they're solidifying. And so you're getting sort of those blocks and margins and things like that. Um, but I think exactly what we're trying to say is that it's a difficult question and we're trying to be careful. And the characteristics that we used here were those block rich margins, the cracks, um, and looking for um, sort of distinct lobes at the edge or margins. Okay, Bill McKinnon wrote, could you go back to that slide with several partially filled craters and nearby block fields? One of the final slides. And yeah, this one, I think, yep. All right, he doesn't have any follow-up from that. So if he's going to type <laughs> it, I will ask David Minton's comment. Uh, Apollo 12 is in the ray of Copernicus. Does Copernicus have similar distal melt features as Tycho? None that we saw in a super superficial check, um, which I think is a really interesting thing in and of itself. Um, I know I have read several papers that suggest that Tycho is maybe you know slightly more oblique of an impact, that this could be maybe we're seeing that this is an unusual production of distal impact melt that has to do with that. I know in the earlier talks there was the discussion of, you know, if you're impacting into Highlands material, if it's more porous, maybe you're producing more melt in that type of a situation, and so seeing it here. Um, but just in a really quick look, I have not seen any of this um, for Copernicus. You also have the issue of you know, the difference in age between Tycho and Copernicus. Maybe it's just that these types of deposits get eroded away really quickly. Okay, and in the minute left, um, I'll just say that Catherine noted, I think in response to what you were just saying, that. We do see some old ones in radar. See Carter et al. 2012. Mm -hmm. um, you might want to get in touch with her. Uh, and Bill McKinnon asks, as a follow-up to this picture, are those craters secondaries? So, I mean, again, I think that's a question of being like, it's, it's really hard to tell. Um, if I go back to the context image sort of of the region, um, so sort of those craters are right here, Bill. Um, and there are Tycho secondaries. Again, there's a really nice chain sort of right here. <laughs> um, so it's a cluster of small craters that I think you could make the argument is roughly along the direction of those. But I think other than that, how you would say, you know, definitively is a difficult question. My, my inclination is to say maybe yes, but I, I, that's just a hypothesis. 